Well, good afternoon. It is Thursday, and it's time to talk about 19th century Europe. All right, first thing about 19th century Europe you have to know is nationalism. Uh, when we talk about nationalism, think about an intense love of nation. Uh, nationalism, not always country-based. Sometimes it you have nations that aren't countries and you have countries that aren't nations. It's very strange. But you might ask, if, it's, if a country is not always a nation, what is a nation then? Well, historians usually say it's going to be something in common. It's going to be common language, common religion, culture, experiences, or politics. Now, some examples of a nation that doesn't have a country. There's a place in Turkey and in Iraq called Kurdistan. The Kurds are a people. They are a nation, but they don't have a country. What makes them a nation? They have a shared language, a shared religion, a shared culture, and they have shared experiences. Now, nationalism in the 19th century is going to be really, really, really powerful. All you have to do for the best example of this is to look at the Austrian Empire. There are numerous rebellions that break out all across the Austrian Empire in 1848, 1849. The Czechs, the, the Hungarians, a bunch of different ethnic groups rebel because they want to, their own nation, their own country in 1848 and 1849. Now, there are a lot of rulers throughout Europe that look down on nationalism because they think it's going to destabilize governments. They think it's going to change the way everything was working. And more often than not, these nationalist movements are crushed as quickly as possible. You have rebellions in France, rebellions in Prussia and the other German states. You've got rebellions in Austria. You have rebellions in Russia. For the most part, all of these nationalist movements are put down, mainly because they want to keep the status quo. They want to keep the Congress of Vienna from the Napoleon days in place as long as they can. Now, the second half of the 1800s, we see many different countries created. Germany is created. Italy is created. Bulgaria, Serbia, the Hungarians get equal status within the Austrian Empire. Most of these new countries, with the exception of Germany, they're unstable. There are a lot of political issues, a lot of tension in places like Serbia, Bulgaria, even in Italy, believe it or not. Austria. It's now known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire after the late 1800s. And there were still a bunch of ethnicities within the Austro-Hungarian Empire that want their independence. The Czechs, the Slovaks, some Serbian groups still want independence. And even the Ottoman Empire is going to begin to fall apart. A country called Romania, a country called Bulgaria, Greece used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. They are going to get their independence. So it's a really tough time with all this nationalism. Now, all of this instability, when you look at it further down the road, it's going to lead to World War I in one way or another. You also have the Crimean War. The Crimean War, it's the big war of the middle of the 1800s. And you're going to end up with Russia, going against Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, and the Kingdom of Sardinia, which will eventually become part of Italy. Now what happens is Russia is looking to expand. It wants what's called a warm water port, meaning a place where it can sail year round. Russia's pretty cold, there's lots of ice up there. And Russia expands into a place called Romania, which was controlled by the Ottomans at the time. Now, the fighting is primarily along the Black Sea, the Crimean Peninsula, which you know was news not that long ago. If you see my mouse, the Crimean is this little orange piece right here. The Black Sea is right there. And then this purple colored turkey, that is kind of the area that Russia wants to go into. Now, there are a couple of things that are very important about this war. One thing, it's not on the slide. There's a woman named Florence Nightingale. She is said to be the creator of the Red Cross. 
Another thing that's not on the slide, there's a very famous poem called The Charge of the Light Brigade. That was a British attack on Russian forces. Um, some stuff that is on the slide. Uh, the first use of trench warfare on a large scale. Over 200,000 people die in this three-year war. It's very often by historians considered the first modern war as well. You have alliances, you've got Russia versus pretty much everybody else. You have propaganda. Um, there was bad talking about other people and convincing your own people to go to war, say it's for a good cause. Modern weaponry, we have early, early machine guns, we've got early modern weapons, and then of course trench warfare, which is gonna become very important in World War I. This war, this three-year war was so bitter and so violent that by the time it's done, countries didn't want to help each other very, very much anymore. And it's going to take a long time for neighbors to come to the aid of their friends in a time of crisis. This is also going to be a time of liberalization. Uh, nationalism is going to wreck Southern and Central Europe, but the 20 years following the Crimean War, Great Britain, France, Russia, United States, they're going to transform. And there's going to be greater political rights, greater legal rights for a large portion of their people. Now in Britain, by the middle of the 1800s, the British government is the envy of the world. Everybody looks up to Britain. Uh, there are two parties. There's the Liberal Party. There's the Conservative Party. <clears throat> the Liberals, they're more open to change. The Conservatives, they want to preserve traditional practices, traditional values. And two very, very famous people in British politics are active at this time. For the Liberals, there's a guy named William Gladstone. He will eventually become a prime minister. And for the Conservatives, there is a guy named Benjamin Disraeli. And he's also going to go on to become a prime minister. Now, the most important thing to know about British government is the second reform bill. It's passed in 1867. The number of voters in Britain are increased from about one and a half million to two and a half million people. And they do that by extending suffrage to more men by lowering how much property you had to own to be allowed to vote. Now the importance of this is it allowed people to feel more in control of the British government. Um, it was more dem democratic and it increased the confidence in the British government. Now the first two working class members of parliament, they're not elected until 1874, so it doesn't happen right away, but changes do happen to bring the British government to more people. France. France is a little bit different. Uh, we've been talking about France a lot, the French Revolution, Napoleon, what happens after Napoleon. Well, when we fast forward to 1848, the king uh, Louis Philippe is thrown out. He is actually forced out of his throne. And Louis Napoleon is elected president of France in 1848. Now he is a relative of the first Napoleon. And as president of France, he is very well liked. In 1851, he convinces the people of France to extend his term of office by 10 years. And then apparently he's doing such a good job that in 1852, the people of France elect him emperor for life. So he gets a little bit of an upgrade. And Louis Napoleon is going to take the name Napoleon III. Now you might ask, why not Napoleon II? Well, Napoleon had a son who died. Napoleon's son would have been Napoleon II. So Louis Napoleon becomes Napoleon III. Now, to make supporters of the French Republican ideals happy, Napoleon III is going to get rid of censorship, and he's going to make his government accountable to the French Parliament. Even though he's emperor, he is going to act like a constitutional emperor, and he's going to let the French Parliament help him rule. Now, all the way up until 1870, things are going well. In 1870, the Franco-Prussian War breaks out. The country of Germany is proclaimed in the Hall of Mirrors in the Louvre or the treaty, not treaty, but the Palace of Versailles. 
that's pretty disastrous. That's pretty embarrassing when a new country is proclaimed in your own capital because your government, your army has failed. So after the Prussian Franco War of 1870, Napoleon III is kicked out of office. Now, once he's gone, there is a truly liberal government that's formed, a democratic parliament is created, and almost 100 years after the French Revolution, France finally has its democracy. Now, the United States and Russia, you might be curious why I put these together. There are actually some similarities. For the United States, white males have almost universal suffrage, black males not so much. In Russia, serfs have no universal suffrage, while free white males have the right to vote. In the United States, after the Civil War, there are more than 4 million slaves emancipated. And in Russia, there are 22 million serfs who are emancipated. Now, if you remember a serf, that is a peasant who is tied to the land. Russian landlords are going to demand compensation for the loss of their serfs. And the Russian government is going to require the serfs themselves to pay for their own freedom. And this is done through 50 year long leases on the land that the serfs were given. Here in the United States, the right to vote is extended to the freed slaves. Those black males are technically allowed to vote, but in the South, something called black codes are passed to keep black males from voting. Some of the black codes were literacy tests, poll taxes, things like that. And if you've ever had U.S. history, you may remember some of that stuff. Now, there's some changes to daily life that are going to happen in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, first of all, there is a second Industrial Revolution. I mentioned when we talked about the Industrial Revolution, there's been more than one. Well, here's your second one. New materials are created. New materials like steel, synthetic dyes, Fertilizers that are made out of chemicals. There is an increased speed of production. Uh, we are not quite to the true assembly line, but things are working quicker because machinery and everything. And all this is going to lead to lower prices. Lower prices mean that everybody can, can buy more stuff. However, the second industrial revolution is going to make a lot of workers miserable. The working conditions are hazardous. The factories are horrible, as we've read a little bit of already. There's overcrowding in cities. The, the colonies are going to be exploited. It's not going to be a good time for everybody. Uh, railroads are going to become the most popular form of transportation. Roughly speaking, the first mile of railroad is laid right around 1850. And by 1880, there are 102,000 railroad miles all across Europe. Telegraph becomes the main form of communication throughout Europe and the world. People could send messages across Europe in a matter of minutes. And then in 1875, as an outgrowth of the telegraph, the telephone is going to be invented. And suddenly people can talk to one another instantaneously. So during the second half of the 18th of the 1800s, the 19th century, the world gets a lot smaller. Now workers are going to have more leisure time, more more food, better food, better housing, but work pretty much is horrible for them. And then you start to get some of the modern services we take for granted today, such as running water, sewer, police protection, fire protection, all of that becomes common after the second half of the, the 19th century. So for some people, things are getting better. For others, not so much. It just kind of depends on where you are. Now, there are five people you need to know. And before I go to these five people you need to know, the word of the day, the secret word, is the word soap. Soap is very important, especially today, and I want you all to be safe and healthy. All right, so secret word is soap. Now, what are the average Europeans thinking at this time? Well, the average European, you know, they're still worried about themselves. They're still mostly Christian. They are starting to understand science. 
Isaac Newton, his beliefs have become pretty standard. Um, people know that the law, supply, and demand are the ones running their world. They also know that things aren't always going to be great. Employers, they think that the social Darwinism, if you remember us talking about that, is the way of life. And then there's this idea called utilitarianism. I didn't put that up there because I'm probably not going to quiz you on it. But there's this idea called utilitarianism. Basically, there's pain and there's gain, there's suffering, but it's all going to equal out short-term pain is good for long-term success. Now, there are five people who don't really agree with that. One is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is best known for the theory of evolution. Um, he's the one who came up with the idea of survival of the fittest. And he wrote this book called On the Origin of Species. Charles Darwin, he's going to come up with this idea that all life came from a common ancestor. And that is primarily accepted now by the scientific community. There are still a few out there who kind of challenge it. But for the most part, his ideas are the ones we stick by. Uh, at the time this came out, this was mind-blowing because they, everybody was still in that kind of Christian point of view. And he really challenged the way that people thought when it came to biology and where we come from. You also have Karl Marx and a co-star named Friedrich Engels who helped Karl Marx write the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx is best known as the founder of communism, and he believed the world was a class struggle. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels worked together. Uh, Karl Marx is going to be uh, working in a factory. Specifically, it's a textile factory that was owned by the father of Friedrich Engels. So both Marx and Engels know what it's like to be a factory worker. And they come up with this idea that the world is a class struggle. It's the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. It's the haves versus the have-nots. The owners versus the workers. And according to Karl Marx, the best way to end this class struggle is through having the workers unite, the workers rise up, throw out the bourgeois, and then afterwards there's this classless society that's created. Now, one of the things that you're required to work to read is the Communist Manifesto. I apologize, but it is very important to, to history. I know it's long. But if you notice, he has a lot of ideas in the Communist Manifesto on what's going to happen, how this classless society can be created, how the workers are going to rise up. It's all going to end up in a violent clash, etc., etc. But if you notice, he does not really say what's going to happen after the class struggle ends. And that's probably the biggest shortcoming of Karl Marx, is he never answers that question, what next? Sigmund Freud, if you have had any psychology classes here at West Georgia Tech or at another school maybe, you may have heard about him. Uh, some of his ideas have been disproved now, but he's still very important. He's best remembered for the theory of id, ego, and superego. And id, ego, and superego ego are supposed to be pretty much within all of us. The id is primitive, impulsive, that is our basic needs, our carnal needs, if you will. Ego is realistic, rational, it makes the decisions. And superego is this holy moral conscience, can do no wrong, everything must be on the up and up, everything must be right. Now, originally Sigmund Freud said that every decision that we make is a fight between these three forces. Id wants something, super ego wants something, and then regular ego must mediate and make the choice between the two. Sigmund Freud, he's going to say that people are not rational. We are humans are not rational, but we are rationalizers, meaning that we take the best of our decisions and we try to do what we think is right. We rationalize everything we do. Think about it, oh, this extra Girl Scout cookie won't hurt me because I'll go and walk an extra mile. That may not be rational from a medical point of view because you're still putting those calorie, calories in your mouth, but 
you rationalize with yourself and say, it's okay if I do X, Y, Z. A sigma Freud is also known for a couple other things, such as the, the Oedipus complex, where supposedly everybody is interested in their mother or something like that. Uh, it's been a long time since I took psychology, so there's a lot more to Sigmund Freud than what I can cover in here. Finally, we've got a guy named Friedrich Nietzsche. He's best known for this theory that God is dead and the Superman theory. Uh, so the God is dead and Superman are the two theories he's best known about. I also want to mention that Nietzsche is, uh, he's institutionalized for being crazy, so take what a, him with a grain of salt. But he argues that people invented the idea of God so that humans would feel more important than they really were. And he said that the idea of Christian morality, it shielded people from their decisions. So you didn't have to make a decision yourself. You just put it into a Christian term, right or wrong, bad, good, moral, or immoral. And that's how you made your decision. There are a lot of people who see this God is dead theory as liberating because it meant that they could take any action they wanted to. There's no such thing as morality. We just live in the moment. And you either do or you don't. You don't have to worry about what happens in the future. You don't have to worry about what happens after you're dead because there is no afterlife. And as you can probably guess, that was very, very upsetting to some people. Now, the Superman theory, I don't have it written down here. But more or less with the Superman theory, what he thought is that there would be a Superman, a larger than life person who would come along, rearrange the world, restructure the world. And it wouldn't be for improvement reasons. It would just because they could. Some examples that he used for the Superman theory, uh, Napoleon was considered a Superman. Uh, today, we would probably think of Hitler as a Superman because he came along and he wanted to remake the world in his own image, not because it was better. In fact, it was a lot worse, but simply because Hitler wanted to do it. So that is a very controversial theory now. Now, Albert Einstein, he's going to become the most prominent scientist of his day and one of the most prominent scientists of all time. He's best known for the theory of relativity, which basically means that depending on where you are in the world, what your perception is, what your experience is, your observation will be different than somebody else's. No two people see the same thing. Of course, the object of science is to replicate results, but if you don't have everything exactly the same, then those measurements will change. So it's all about relative perspective. If you look at something and then your neighbor looks at something, they're not gonna see the exact same thing because the points of view are different, the way you're looking at things are different. We don't even see the same color, so my blue may be different than your blue. Some other things that Albert Einstein does, quantum theory, which has to do with lights, and then unified theory, which has to do with leptons, quarks, um, everything that's supposed to hold mass together and makes up the world around us. And what's really interesting is almost everything that Albert Einstein theorized all the way from the theory of, of gravitational waves to quarks and leptons, it's all been proven true up to this point. So he's one of the most important scientific minds of our day. Now, last thing I want to do here is show you what the Blackboard page looks like one more time. Let me exit out of this real quick. And remember syllabus, the syllabus page is going to be where you can find the virtual office hours. Remember that loads discord. The course schedule is now up to date. You will see that the SLO rough draft is due on Sunday along with your secret word quiz. And you will also find that there is a quiz on the Communist Manifesto and on 19th century Asia. I'll show you that here in just a moment. I'm going to go to lessons. And I'm going to go to lessons again because I have the extra step. And then 19th century Asia, 19th century Europe.
19th century Europe. You can see the PowerPoint I posted yesterday, the manifesto quiz, which I'll open up here in just a moment. And then also you'll have your secret word quiz here as well. 19th century Asia and have not already looked at it. You can see my PowerPoint, you can see my lecture video, and then quiz again. All right, so that is it for today. I hope you have a good weekend, and we'll be back with you on Tuesday. We'll see you soon.